वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम सुचंद्र घोष प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एनशियंट इंडियन हिस्ट्री एंड कलचर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकाटा द सब्जेक्ट इज टूडे इंडियन कलचर द टॉपिक इज इंडियन पॉलिटी एंड आई विल बी डिस्कसिंग विथ यू द सोर्स ऑफ एनशियंट इंडियन पॉलिटी इन दिस मॉड्यूल द फोकस वुड बी टू लुक एट द सोर्सेज दैट यू बींग यूज टू अंडरस्टैंड द नेचर ऑफ एनशियंट इंडियन पॉलिटी आवर ट्रस्ट विल बी on textual epigraphic numismatics and art historical sources rather than the field archaeological sources so how the sources are being used for understanding polity will be discussed in this module now to construct a meaningful image of ancient indian polity a thorough understanding of the sources is indispensable in this module uh, as i mentioned earlier our focus would be to look at these sources how these sources are talking about different kinds of administration or talking about the political structure of a particular dynasty in case of polity when we choose our sources our trust is more on texts then inscriptions also help us a lot and some of the coinages of some dynasties are very important art historical material also helps us to understand uh some in some cases where they represent or they are projected as political statement but the archaeological for example the field archaeological materials are not very important to us so we know we have to know what kind of sources talk about the political construction or political structure a holistic study of these diverse sources with a method that critically explores the meaning and the words or visuals may help us in our understanding even partially the political organization of early india our problem with our sources is that we have paucity of sources but whatever we have we have to reconstruct or construct the history now if we look at the history of research or the historiography of ancient indian polity we find that in the oriental and the utilitarian historiography early india was seen always as a land of philosophers only excelling in spiritual and mystic thoughts lacking in political or material speculation which means the material culture of our country was neglected and indian swell look seen as more spiritually inclined against this imperialistic ideology the indian scholars whom we normally call nationalist scholars attempt to understand the polity from the late 19th century onwards they wanted to show the world that we have a political structure which was like democracy which was like republic and that ancient indians were not only deeply inclined towards the spiritual life rc dutt in his article civilization in the brahmana period presented an ideal picture of the king who did justice to all in 1907 ac das highlighted the existence of limited monarchy though not absolute he also pointed out that in cases of local self government in ancient india in a better form than the british rule when he is talking of local self government it is actually the chola local self government which he has in mind the writings of kp jaiswal between uh, 1912 and 1915 formed a subject of his famous book the hindu polity in 1924 and it set a benchmark in this line and were repeatedly used by following generation of scholars k p jaiswal was deeply a nationalist historian and when he was talking about the ganashangas the non monarchical powers he felt that these were actually the democratic kind of government which was there in athens according to jaiswal the ancient hindu political system was partly of republics of the athenian type and of the constitutional monarchies like great britain now there were other scholars who discussed ancient indian polity and they were p n banerji k v rangaswamy r c majumdar shama sastri n n law r k mukherjee and so on but the most impressive among them were un goshals a history of hindu political theories 
Ghoshal rejected Max Muller's and Bloomfield's theory of absence of state in ancient India. This was the reason because they thought that there was no state concept of state and therefore the political structure was not well formulated. Nationalist scholars tried to prove the superiority of the ancient institutions of India over those of the ancient West. So therefore, deliberate attempts were taken to prove ancient Indian state as secular without discussion on religious aspects of ancient Indian polity. Completely different from these approaches are the works of R.S. Sharma, Romila Thapar, B.D. Jattopadhyay, Harman Kulke and these genre of historians not only tried to look at the state society from a different angle but also trace the route from pre-state to state, the transition from pre-state to state or how there was kind of polity which could be called integrative polity or whether uh, it goes against the different kind of state structures were put forward by them. Professor Chattopadhyay, basing his arguments on the land grant charters, tried to understand the process of political formation which led to the emergence of regional state structure in the early medieval India, which is generally from 600 to 1300 CE. Now, with this brief background of the historiography, let us look at the category of sources. We can broadly divide Two, in, them into two categories. Of course, the textual category is much heavier because here we have representation of a lot of sources which talks about the Indian political system or about the polity of the uh, kings or political structure of the period. So, among the texts, we have to read the Vedas, the Dharma Shastras, the Mahabharatas, and Ramayana. Uh, Puranas, Arthashastra, Kamandakas Nitishara, Somadeva Sudhi's Nitivakyam Ritam, Buddhist and Jain texts, other indigenous texts, and foreign accounts. Foreign accounts were those of the Greco Romans, the Chinese, and the Arabo Persian. Among the archaeological, we have a large variety of epigraphic sources, which are inscriptions from various genres. Then we have coins, and of course, art historical material. To begin with the textual sources, of course we have to start with the Vedas. The Rig Veda as you know is the earliest among the Vedas which inform us about the early Vedic period. Then we have the later Vedic period but in this uh, understanding of the Vedic corpus we can see the transition where we have a transition from Gopati to Mahamahipati. We can see that how new assemblies were being brought, uh, brought up. So we have assemblies like Shabha and Shamiti. Then we have Bidhata, another very important assembly found in the Vedic literature. And the people were known as Visha. And the entire corpus gives us an idea that how actually the um, Vedic political structure was being formulated. The Rig Vedic people were moving from one region to the another. So their kind of polity, they were not known as uh, big kings. They called themselves Rajan and how they were moving from the region of the Indus to the Ganga Valley. That is also very much represented in the Vedas. And with this movement, the political structure also changes. In the Vedic corpus, as I mentioned, we have this representation of Shabha, Shomiti and Vidhata and there are, uh, if we look at this corpus, we find that a huge number of times they are mentioned. So you have Shabha and Shomiti for 8 times, 8 and 6 times, Vidhata for 21, 22 times. Again, the Atharva Veda talks about Shabha and Shomiti as the two daughters of Prajapati. So this is very interesting that Prajapati Brahma is represented as the father of these two assemblies. So one was the Shabha and the other was the Shamiti. And the term Shabha denotes both the assembly and the assembly hall. It was restricted to the elect that is of the Brahmanas and the elders. Common people were not very much a part of the uh, Shabha. And the Shabha also exercised judicial functions 
Initially it might have been a clan assembly but with the passage of time it underwent changes. On the other hand we have uh, according if you look at Ludwig's writings he, it consisted of common people like Vish people like Visha and then they were the, the rich patrons were also there of these assemblies and they were known as Maghavan. So the Vedic assemblies were also uh, very important in understanding the political structure. Now we'll move into the later Vedic phase and when we look at the later Vedic phase, the literature, we find again that we have these uh, institutions called Vidhata, Shabha and Samiti but they are more structured and uh, then along with the ordinary people we find the presence of king, uh, Shamrat but interestingly here the, it is not a full-fledged monarchical structure. In contrast to the tribal chieftainship of the early Rig Vedic times, the later Vedic polity witnesses the beginning of the elements of state, the taxation system and the administrative machinery and which was supported by the introduction of agriculture, stable agriculture. And like we have in the Shatapata Brahmanas also the mention of the kingdom. And there, there are a lot of stories in the Shatapata Brahmana and in the later Vedic uh, culture we also have the presence of Rajashiya sacrifices which are one step forward in the formation of a kingdom and statehood. So this information gives us an idea that how there was a complete change or a transition from the Rig Vedic to the later Vedic. The next genre of literature that uh, we have to discuss, actually it goes on like Dharma Shastra, then Puranas and the epics. So we have the Dharma Shastras, these are also known as the Dharma Sutras and these are actually prescriptive or normative texts which inform us about the polity, society, economy and so on. Since they are prescriptive in nature, they talk about the norms that this one has to do this, the king has to do that. <coughs> so this kind of normative literature gives us a whole lot of account of the powers and politics of the ruler. Among the Dharma Shastric texts, Manusmriti uh, have to be paid special attention because the chapter 7 of this Manusmriti talks about Raja Dharma and Raja Dharma is one point which is discussed in many of the Sriti literature where a king, how he should behave, what are the protocols of the no, of the court, these are all discussed and from there we can understand. Next comes the epic literature. Epics are huge minds, huge sources for understanding our political system, particularly the Mahabharata. And then Mahabharata has different parvas. The Shanti Parvan of the Mahabharata will be very important for us to understand the political structure and these will be discussed in details when we are talking about epic polity. Another genre of literature which is very important uh, as a source are the Puranas. Now there are 18 Mahapuranas and Puranas were not written at one go. So therefore the, we find that it also gives us stories on one side and on the other side the Puranas gives us a list of the genealogical table of the rulers and it so happens that sometimes if you compare the genealogical table of a particular dynasty in a Purana with the epigraphs they don't tally but at times there are um, cases where we have the name from the Puranas and we know that that person that ruler is also mentioned in the uh, inscription. For example, we have this Besnagar pillar inscription of Heliodorus where he says that he goes to the court of Kasiputra Bhagavadra. Now in the Purana we have, we know about a king from the Shunga dynasty who was, uh, who could be identified with this Bhagavadra. So this way we can actually study our sources by a comparative method. We have another source uh, called the Upa Puranas and the Upa Puranas were much more local and they were also regional and here we must mention the name of R.C. Hajra who has done immense work on the Upa Puranas. 
The next very important category and particularly for statecraft, the text is Arthashastra. We all know about Arthashastra and generally Arthashastra's datings also it is said that you have the second Adhikarana which is comparable to the Mauryan period and the later Adhikaranas are much later of course. This gives us a clear picture of the state. It refers to the seven elements of the state. The seven elements are Swami, that is the head of the state, Amatta, governmental machinery, Janapada, territory and population, Durga, which is the 45 settlement, Kosha is treasury, then you have Danda, which is coercive power, and Mitra, that is friend. So these are the seven elements, and it is said that a state can function, that is, a king will be in the center and he can function when he has the seven elements with him. So after Arthashastra, it gives us a lot of other information if you go deep into this. Then we have Kamandaka's Nitisharo. Kamandaka's Nitisharo was originally said to be a, dated to 800 uh, CE, but uh, there is a new dating now which says that it could be dated between 500 to 700. This is a treatise on politics written in Sanskrit and it is based largely on the Arthashastra model. But there are some kind of uniqueness to this uh, text because it discusses uh, political paramountcy and prosperity of the subjects and it also talks about politics of violence and the reciprocal relationship between the ruler and his Anujivis, that is his Shamantas. So the courtly culture is very much uh, described in Kamandaka's Nitishara. We have another text called Somadeva series, uh, Shuri's Niti Vakyam Ritam, that is dated to the 10th century CE. Shomajira Suvi was a, core, uh, was a patron, uh, court poet of the Rashtrakutas. It was also greatly influenced by Arthashastra and it draws heavily its subject from the earlier texts, but it can be a very important treatise for understanding early medieval polity. The next, apart from this text, the next genre of texts are the Buddhist and the Jain texts. Buddhist and the Jain texts are not actually religious texts. These texts give us an idea of the states, administration and then early Pali and non-canonical and non-canonical literature also gives us a good amount of idea about the political system of our uh, ancient Indian period of that point of time. For example, we have this text called Digha Nikaya. Digha Nikaya is so important to us because it clears and it can be dated around 3rd century BC and it clearly tells us about the origin of the kingship of the state. It conceives of a happy, peaceful and pure society, an idol born in ancient times. Gradually then, it talks about the complexities of life, that there were differences uh, within the people, life appeared and the vices and there were several problems with which the people were plagued. And so they naturally wanted that there should be some kind of understanding and administrator. So they agreed to choose a leader as the chief, that is the king, a person who was to be considered the most favored, most attractive and most capable. The chosen or elected person would be one who should be, I, I quote, uh, who should be wrathful where indignation is right, who should censure that which rightly be censured and who should banish him who deserves to be banished." Unquote. Now the people agreed to give him in return a portion of the rice produced by them. So this was a kind of a beginning of a taxation. It, that was a tribute, a voluntary tribute and it was said that the person who would be chosen, he will be known as the Mahasammata, that is the great approved one. So all of the subjects are in consonance or in agreement to choose their leader and here comes a leader who is a Mahasammata. Much before this text we have a Sanskrit treatise or Sanskrit grammatical text like Panini's Ashtadhai and then for the post mauryan period we have Patanjali's Mahavarsha. While the former refers to the existence of Ganeshangas, 
which are often translated as republics but it is actually not republic it's, it's a different kind of polity and the latter throw light on the post Mauryan administration for example Panine talks of the Ganeshangas and he talks about the different people who were a part of the Ganeshangas the Yodhyas and he calls them the Ayudha Jivi Shangha means the Shangha the people of the Shangha we, uh, actually sub, sub, uh, uh, leads on leaves on the use of arms so that is ayudha jivi shangha then we have patanjali's mahavarsha where while he is teaching a grammatical rule he talks about the incursion of the shakas the yavanas that they are coming and they are actually conf moving into regions okay. like saketa which is ayodha and so therefore the whole political information the history can be gleaned from these dramatical lines and then we know that Pushyamitra Sunga performed two Ashwamedha Yajins so he is known as the Ashwamedha Yajina from of course Patanjali's Mahavarsha and then there is another inscription of Adhuja Ayodhya inscription of Dhanadeva so these texts are very important to us next comes the Sangam literature. Sangam literature uh, actually can be dated from the 3rd century BC to the 3rd century CE and there are other literatures also which follows for example the Silakpatikaram, the Manimekalai these follows and they capture the changing political landscape of the uh, far south how for how the land of the Chola, Chera, Pandyas witnessed the transition. So from the Sangam literature we know that that the clan based organization change to the dominance of the chief and ultimately leading towards a more categorical uh, power uh, structured power and this is gleaned from this entire Sangam literature we have like grammatical texts like Tolkapiyam uh, then Pattu Pattu and these give us a very interesting insight into the functioning of the state now we move on to from the indigenous literature resources we move into the foreign accounts there are a huge number of accounts we don't have we can't go through all of them but what we find that in this genre we have the greco-roman texts we have the chinese and the perso arabic literature and they supply us valuable data on the polity or political structure so when we talk about um, the Greco-Roman sources, we have the historians of Alexander's and then we have Megasthenes' Indica, which is actually lost. And Indica has been uh, collected by three persons. One is Diodorus Siculus, other is Arian and the third is Trebo. So in their writings, we have portions of Indica and so therefore if you compare then sometimes there is a discrepancy uh, but it gives us a huge number of insight into the Mauryan administrative system then we have this Chinese text called uh, CV key of the Tatang CU key that is written by Zhuangzang and uh, the famous Chinese Buddhist pilgrim who came during the time of the ruler called Harshavardhana. So he gives us a whole idea of the different kinds of principalities that were present, that were there in the Indian subcontinent. He had come to India from the northwest, he entered to Gandhara and then he was a very respected scholar in the court of Harshavardhana. He studied in Nalanda, went to, came to Bengal, went to Kamrup and he gives us a huge description of the different kinds and talks about the command of Harshavardhana, the political structure of the kingdom of the Harshavardhana. So he, his accounts are extremely important for us to understand the political structure. Then we have uh, Al-Biruni, for example, among the Parsi Arabic literature, we have Al-Biruni's India, where he also talks about the Indian subcontinent. It gives us detail about the political structure. Apart from these foreign texts, we have another very important source, and that's the archaeological source. Now, among the archaeological sources, we have the inscriptions, that is the epigraphic sources inscriptions can be of various types so it these are diff, like royal proclamations donative records land grants precious eulogies pilgrim records and so on 
but then we have the first inscriptions that is the Ashokan inscriptions which are of a different class and Ashoka was in direct conversation with his subjects and we find that Ashoka actually if, if you look at the Ashokan inscriptions the Mauryan political structure is much understood by the use of different um, people, the different administrative offices and he talks about spies, Pativedaka, so it gives us insights. Then we have the, the post-Mauryan period, after the Ashoka um, Mauryan rule, we have the rule of the foreign powers and of course the local rulers. So the Sunga dynasty starts and then we have the Yavanas, the Shakas, the Pahlavas and the Kushanas and they had inscribed inscriptions which gives us an idea of the polity. We can remember here the Karavala's Hatigomfa inscription which was and particularly an year to year account, it is written in a linear style, an year to year account of his kingdom. So we know how Kar Karavala was going, uh, ruling his kingdom, how where he was going to different areas with his huge army and what kind of uh, administration he actually foresaw for himself. Another very important inscription is the Elabad Prashasti inscription of that is the Elabad pillar inscription of Samudragupta and these are the, some of the very important specimens from which we can have uh, political information. From the Gupta period onwards, particularly for understanding the polity of the post-Gupta times, uh, inscriptions, that is the land grant charters, they are very important by, because they are by far the most important data. Huge, there were proliferation of land grants in this period and this gives us a lineage also, a genealogical list and then the talks about the achievements of their rulers and sometimes the kind of administration. So definitely indicates that there was a shift in the attitude also and there was a necessity for these rulers that they wanted to have legitimation and therefore they talked a lot of about their genealogy and from this we can understand the kind of political structure they are actually arguing for unlike in the earlier phase. We now move on to coins, numismatics. Numismatics as a source are very important because they, it, this is the medium through which the ruler can project himself, his ideologies and therefore we have coins from where we know that how for example there is a coin of Puru, Porus and this coin represents the defeat of Porus uh, by in the hands of Alexander. Then if you look at the Kushana coins, the Kushana coins in the post modern period, we have lot of um, the, uh, the Greek coins also. So if you look at the Kushana coins, then it gives us an idea of the divine kingship of the Kushana rulers because then we see in these coins the king coming out from the clouds there's a nimbate around, there's a halo around the king. So therefore, the divine character of the king comes out from the coin. A very famous example of the Gupta coin, which talks about the political might of the Guptas, is the Ashwamedha type of coin issued by Samudra Gupta. He was the first person to issue the Ashwamedha type of coin, gold coins, where we have on the obverse the horse and on the reverse a lady, she could be the queen or she could be the deity, there is a controversy on this. But the representation of the horse, the sacrificial horse is very important uh, for us. And because the Elavad pillar inscription does not talk about Shamudra Gupta's performance of Ashwamedha sacrifice. So this is the only source from which we know that he performed the Ashwamedha sacrifice. Coins also give us some comes up with some epithets of the rulers deities on coins of the indo greeks and kushana coins also uh, disclose the relation between religion and polity the deities chosen by the indo greek kings for representation on coins tended to be those that could be used as symbols of power such as zeus heracles athena the tribal non-monarchical coins of the yodhyas Kunindas, Malavas, Sibis help us to understand their form of governance 
which has often been considered as republics but they are actually uh, they could be a kind of oligarchy or as Ramila Thapa says that it is a kind of a uh, proto-state. Now these Ganeshanga type of polity uh, moved from the Punjab region, the, they came across um, the Indus and uh, settled mostly in the Rajasthan area. Therefore, in the Rudradaman's Junagar inscription, he talks about defeating the Yodhyas who were loathsome. So, they were an important intruder into the domain of Rudradaman. And then this group called Yodhyas, they have in their coins this epithet Gana. So, we have the term Yodhya Ganasya Jaya on the numismatic specimens. And so, therefore, we know their mode of stru governmental structure so that they followed non-monarchical polity. But gradually we find after interaction with the monarchies, they were moving gradually towards the monarchical polity and sometimes they use the title Maharaja which is absolutely of a monarchical polity. During the time of the Guptas, these non-monarchical powers were completely defeated by Samudra Gupta and after that we do not hear of them. Coming to the coinage of the Guptas, we find that they throw important light to understand the nature of kingship and administration. The Chandragupta Kumara Devi type coin issued by Chandragupta I bears the testimony of the fact that the Lichavis and Guptas at a certain point of time came close and also made an alliance and it might be interpreted as a matrimonial alliances. The issue of the Ashmeta type of coins I have already mentioned is very important and following Samudra Gupta, it was Kumara Gupta first who also issued the Ashmeta type of coin and this reflect a strong monarchical structure of the Guptas. Furthermore, like the Guptas, uh, the other the post also took deliberate attempts to attribute divine power of the state which is evident from the coins. So therefore, coins were used or could be used as a political statement therefore and this is highly understood from the kushana coins also now in the domain of art history we have we do not have the large uh, examples or the huge examples that we have in coins but there are very significant art historical evidences which gives us an idea that how a particular panel or how a particular sculpture can actually project, can actually talk about the political happenings and also about the structure of polity. Here we will talk about the famous Varaha panel of Udayagiri which is near Vidisha that is in Madhya Pradesh. And will show that in this, in the visual arts there are ample scope for connecting political reality with the representation of gods and goddesses. So this is the Bor incarnation that is the Varaha incarnation of Vishnu and it is a glowing example because here you can see Vishnu is being represented as very huge, it's a large representation and all the other human forms are very depicted in a small way. So the might of Vishnu and then we have Bhudevi who is very standing, clinging to Vishnu, very close and very delicate, which shows that Baraha has rescued Bhudevi from the onslaught. So it is, it, the story goes, tallies well with Chandragupta's own defeat of the Shakas. It tells us that about an act. Uh, we know that Chandragupta II, son and successor of Shamudragupta, he was the first ruler to have defeated the Western Kshatrapas who were ruling in Gujarat region that is Shorashtra, Ujjaini and he actually em started emulating the Western Kshatrapas and issued the silver coins. Samudra Gupta did not have silver coins, so it was only the gold coins and copper coins. Now Chandragupta II started for the first time the issuance of silver coins. So the Varaha panel was actually talking about an act and this act relates to his defeat of the Western Kshatrapa rulers which brought him to the pinnacle of glory. So it is in this context that the imposing relief 
of Varaha at Udayagiri was created. Whenever we see an art object, it is very important to understand the context of the object. Chandragupta II indeed rescued the earth from the clutches of the enemies like the boar shaped Vishnu rescued Bhudevi. So the this image one can also bring in the ins inscription uh, in Udayagiri cave 2 where it is said that he was here in Udayagiri with the intention Krishna Prithvi Jayarthena that he wanted to actually win over the entire Prithibi, that uh, this entire world and that was reflected in this image the Varaha panel again secondly from the Gupta period only we have if you go to Lucknow Museum we have a larger than life sculpture of horse carved out of beige sandstone and it has been found from Khairigar in UP it is now housed in the Lucknow State Museum this horse is said to be a replica of Samudra Gupta's Ashwamedha horse and uh, there are some inscriptions also written some in Brahmi and some in uh, shell script or ornamental Brahmi. So it has been suggested that this horse represents the sacrificial horse as I uh, mentioned and it was used in one of the sacrifices and this representation of Ashwamedha has also been found in the coins of Kumara Gupta uh, first. So this might be an instant of the show of power by an apex political authority. Therefore, images were being used as political statement and there is another very interesting example about the position of the Lord Tripurantaka. Gerd Mevison has done a wonderful work on this and we find that the placing of an image in a particular temple becomes very important. Here they, we find that in case of Raja Singheshwara temple, the Pallava ruler placed all the Tripurantaka images towards the direction of his main enemy, the early western Chalukyas located in northwestern Deccan. So the Chalukya, there is, it gives us an indication of the Chola Chalukya struggle. So since the Chalukyas were in northwestern Deccan, so Tripurantaka image was looking at northwest so that they could be defeated. Then again we find that in case of Rajarajeshwara temple, the Tripurantaka images face all directions which can be indicated as Rajaraja's well-known claim of paramount over lordship. At Darasuram, Rajendra Chola II constructed the monumental stone chariot of Tripurantaka with his movement from north to south as a last great effort to regain control over his southern enemies. Thus, Tripurantaka images were introduced as a political statement by these rulers. So, what we find from, uh, if we look at these sources, we've, it helps us to trace the changing scenario of ancient Indian polity through the lens of this variety of sources. The immense importance of inscriptions and coins for sketching the outline of ancient Indian polity demands special attention in this regard. Normally, we have a tendency to look at mainly the textual sources, but it is also important for us to look at uh, the inscriptions, read the inscriptions between the lines and find out what is written, not explicitly, but implicitly within the uh, written words. Literary text of course helps us to comprehend the same scenario but that should be consulted with a bit of caution as they were put to writing much later and moreover there is a problem of dating literary texts. Most of the textual uh, texts are very difficult to date whereas in inscriptions we find that we have the paleography or in some cases uh, the inscriptions are dated inscriptions. So here um, if we look at the art history then we find that there is also a possibility of political expression in re uh, religious arts. So therefore, uh, it is important to understand the nature of the sources. Uh, sources can be looked at from different perspectives and read from different perspectives. So therefore, for an un thorough understanding of ancient Indian polity, 
each of the sources and with their co correlations with other sources should be understood and studied. Now these are in a nutshell some of the sources that I have discussed with you here but uh, if you go through the e-text you will find that each and every sources are discussed in a little more detailed manner and from that you can construct or have an idea of how to use the sources and sources remember are not one-sided it has it gives you many stories so we have to understand and read the stories properly to reconstruct a proper history of ancient Indian polity. Thank you.